Welcome back, everybody. It's Chad Graham, along with John Peterson, and another uh, edition of We Talk Photo. This is going to be both an audio and a video version. So those of you who are listening to this, if you'd like to watch it on YouTube, it's a We Talk Photo on YouTube. Um, like a lot of other people, we've migrated to the, uh, the, the, the technology. So we're audio and video on this one. And today we have a... You know, my one of my favorite people in the world, and um, I'm so honored to call him one of my best friends, um, Guy Tal from the metropolis of Torrey, Utah. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Man. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. We were talking before this. Uh, we we went live here. This building that Guy's in is a is a is a house that he literally built out of a garage that was in his backyard and got it. I, I, we were talking, it's been, I'm thinking 15, maybe a little longer years since I remember seeing that and you mentioning it, you were going to convert that into an office. And, um, it looks great. I love the, the wood. Oh, thank you. Yeah. The building itself is probably about a hundred years old. The, the wood that it's made of was cut right here in the local forest. Yeah. It's almost as old as me. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you for being here. And um, you know, I guess, I guess the question, guy, that every you know, I'm thinking like if I was a listener, what would I want to hear from guy? And the mm -hmm. listeners, and John, you know, we have to do we have to go yes. into this live stream thing at some point where we can have people on and ask questions and interact. Yeah, and that'd be fun. But guy, what's new? And let's save the big headline for make everybody wait here. We have a huge headline for it. <laughs> huge headline. And no guy did not hit the lottery. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And and he didn't get rid of his cameras yet. That is yeah. the big news. Yeah, I didn't win. Yeah. But, but <laughs> what do you been what have you been up to? Uh well it's it's kind of interesting because people ask what's new and for me there's always something new I I get bored pretty quickly so yeah I'm just I'm just uh, spending more of my time outside I'm experimenting with new styles of photography I'm discovering new places that's that's been my life for a couple of decades now and I I just love doing that um yeah I guess if you, if you go on my website you'll see I, I update it every every month or so. Uh, but uh, I posted some new work. And recently I, I took it as a challenge. Somebody said that you, you can't create portfolios that mix color and black and white. And uh, I, I thought I'd give it a try and see if that can be done. So I, I have one of those on my website now, sort of an experimental. And I'm not I'm sure I'm quite there yet, but I'm having fun playing around with it. You know, when people look at your stuff and, you know, I, I look at it a lot. People say, man, you know, your your work is getting so you know it's, it's improving it's it's getting you know you're really getting and you know I think what you're doing your your work is really I mean this is not negative but it's 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 similar to what you've done in the past it's just evolving uh, yeah and I I think that's I, I like to think of myself as an expressive artist and, you know, self-expression is expressing yourself, expressing your own thoughts, your feelings, your, your, your being a human being in the world. And so as, as I evolve myself, I, I hope that my photography and my work evolve with me, but yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a revolution. It's an evolution. Yeah. It goes different ways, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I always, you know, I always like to think that, uh, the photography is a form of visual communication and, you know, we learn new words and we learn a different or an expanded vocabulary and, and, uh, as, as speakers. And so why shouldn't our photography as a communication medium also expand and grow with, uh, just, you know, subtle changes. It's not like we speak a different language. Like I'm not going from English to German, but I'm maybe using bigger words or in no, of case, course, smaller yeah. words. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're an artist and you're not evolving, you're in deep trouble. Yeah, but actually, actually, I think that 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 touches on a on a kind of a, a raw nerve in in photography, where a lot of it for a lot of years have just been extremely repetitive. You know, there's people that evolve, and everybody else follows their evolution instead of evolving independently. And I I think that's unfortunate. Uh, you know, a lot of art used to be very individualistic. It's about expressing 
your your uniqueness what makes you different from other people and now it's almost become the exact opposite where people try to conform and say hey I, i've been there too i've done that same thing too i've i you know it, it's it's become more more of a conformist culture instead of a creative culture and i think that's kind of unfortunate um at, at least in terms of people's own inner individual experience i, I yeah. think the experience of creating something of your own of, of seeking that way of expressing yourself is enormously more rewarding because it's enormously more challenging Oh, I, yeah, I agree you know, with you. Yeah, I mean, the ultimate compliment is to look at an image and say, you know, that's a that's a Guy Tal photograph, or you know, that, that's John Coltrane, or you know, that's the ultimate compliment. And I think that's something you know, I think we should all strive for. It's fine. Yeah, I, but but I think you know, Guy, as you were talking, what what came into my head was emulation is easy, mm-hmm. creation. Um, you know, it's hard. It's hard work evolving yourself. Yeah. It, and growth takes effort and work. Oh, no and if we as artists want to grow and evolve, we have to put in the work. Yeah, but you can that. say that. Yeah, you can say that's literally a life's work is to evolve and to try to try to get as 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 far as you can you know while you're alive while, while you're functioning uh so yeah i i, I don't like the, the idea of uh you know that stagnation and conformity and it another thing that's sad to me is there's there's so much of that uh consumerist gear oriented growth paths that people take that to me is just i think it's unfortunate you know i, I see so much uh emphasis now on people going back to film and i I I don't really see the I mean it's it's an enjoyable medium but uh, I don't really see much creative work coming out of it it's just the fact that you're using film alone doesn't make you expressive doesn't make you creative doesn't make you an artist it might make your process more meaningful and enjoyable but in the end it's about what you actually do with it I have a question how and I think I know the answer but this you know this is another thing that I think some of our listeners might be thinking about so, you know, in a day or two, you're going to get in your vehicle and you're going to disappear again. Mm-hmm. And of your of, of the images that are, say, on your web page under new material, and I'm guessing on the front page is probably maybe 10 or 12. Oh, probably. Um, how many of those images did you go out on purpose to to uh, make? I think, I, think you know, I think you know the answer to that. Yes. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, can we just for a couple of minutes expand on that thought? Um, sure. I, I, if you read research, I, I'm going to go back to some scientific and philosophical uh, underpinnings here. If you, if you read about uh, creativity and, and what makes some people more creative than others it's very strongly correlated with the personality trait that's studied very very much in a personality psychology called openness to experience uh, and openness to experience is exactly what it sounds like it's being open to new things uh it, it's not becoming too caged in your existing ideas, in your existing process, in your existing um, way of thinking. Uh, and so people that score higher, there's ways of measuring that in, in psychological testing. Uh, people that rank higher in openness to experience are generally more creative. Uh, again, there's ways of measuring creativity too with various tests. Um, and so for me, that that's a cornerstone of just is just being out there with no preconception. Uh, so that that's part of the science. The other part of the science is... Uh, Creative people generally excel at something called divergent thinking. Uh, divergent thinking, uh, well, I'll start with most people follow most things in life with something called convergent thinking. Convergent thinking means applying known methodologies toward known solutions. So you go into a situation, you have a problem you want to solve, and you use things that you already know to arrive at a solution that you've already preconceived in advance is what would be the best outcome. Divergent thinking is the opposite of that, which is you go into a situation with no preconceived outcome. You don't know what the best outcome of that situation is going to be. And you figure it out as you go along. And the way that you figure it out is at any point where you have the opportunity to make a decision, you try to imagine, you try to conceive as many possible solutions to that particular problem in real time and then pick the one that works right there on the spot and then move on from there. 
And so obviously that correlates with creativity because you get into a situation with no preconceived outcome. You try to come out with as many possible solutions as you can on the spot and then pick from that. And so you have, you have a much higher chance of ending up with something that you have not thought of before, that you have not tried before, perhaps that have not been done by anyone else before. Uh, so these two, these two uh, aspects of it, the divergent thinking and being open to new experiences, those those are cornerstones of creativity research. Those those are traits of creative people. And for me, being creative, uh, being engaged in a in a creative activity is is one of the most rewarding things in life. That's the thing that leads to to uh, phenomena like like flow, sometimes even to awe. Um, and for me, those are the most rewarding things that I can experience. And so, again, going back to our original discussions about wanting to make the most out of your your one limited lifespan. I want to maximize the value of it. I want to experience flow as often as I can. I want to experience awe as often as I can. And so it's important to me to be mindful not to preconceive things, not to chase after things that I've are already known, that I've already done, or that others have already done, because I know that's not going to be as rewarding for me uh, cumulatively over time. So so to sum, beautiful guy, I love that. Um, so, so to kind of sum it up a little bit is... It, there's three kind of big words that stuck in my head, which is open. You know, when you go out, you're open. Then you need to be receptive, be willing to take stuff in. And then you need to react to that, to create Express with it, whatever yeah. emotion, hopefully it's emotion, more more um, visceral and not cerebral, but but react to what you're receiving. And that's, truly where some of the biggest creativity comes from mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. I, I forgot the word that you use but uh really it comes down to to when you said noticing things that that's that's the essence of mindfulness as being being as aware as you can possibly be of what's happening around you and within you and then finding ways to merge all those things along with all your experience and knowledge of of visual expression uh to to create something that expresses whatever it is that you're feeling yeah. Is there anything more important than that that you think you know people should be aware of when they're when they're you know in that in 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 that zone? Well, I, I think importance is is a relative thing. It depends on what you want to accomplish. But if you look at it from the point of view of how can I live in the most meaningful, rewarding way, then I would say that becomes the most important thing. You want to find the way of working, the the kind of process, the way of approaching things that over time would yield you the greatest life rewards. Uh, and for me, being creative, being expressive, being constantly, you know, never, never settling down, always trying to learn new things, always trying to do new things, always trying to figure out if some things can be done or how they can be done. To me, that's, you know, the, the, the spice of life. That's what ultimately makes my life more rewarding because every now and then, I would either get an experience of flow when I'm really engaged in something, or I might experience, uh, like I mentioned, an experience of awe when I'm just amazed by something. And that's an incredibly rewarding thing. It's not just in the moment, but the memories that you create from that. And then later on thinking about it and then reliving those memories when you look at your images. Uh, so th those, those to me are the things that, you know, they might not be important in any small constrained sense but overall when you look back on the totality of your life and what you got to do what you got to experience what you got to see you know what what you did with with the opportunities that, that you had to me those are the things that would carry the most weight i think is it me being you know a certain age or is that going away uh no actually it doesn't go away what happens is people uh the the problem with getting older and creativity as people become set in their ways uh they become i think the term is enculturated as you kind of get used to doing things a certain way and you get rewarded for things over and over and that's the essence of a, a psychological uh movement called behaviorism which is things that you get rewarded for, for you're going to want to repeat and things that you get penalized for or that you fail in you're going to want to stop and then over time you're not even making your own decisions anymore. Your brain just knows, hey, this is fun. I'm going to get rewarded for that. I'm going to think that way or do that way. And uh, <clears throat> for a long time, uh, it was thought that this was something that you couldn't resist. Uh, there was a very famous psychologist that came up with that term. Uh, his name was B.F. Skinner. Uh, so yeah. he he coined that idea of behaviorism. Uh, but then, uh, then 
some people came out and challenged him on that. They said, no, that's doesn't, not always true. And one of the people that challenged him on that was the author of the, the Flow book, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, and he said, yeah, that might be true in a lot of ways for a lot of people. But look at artists, for example. Artists don't necessarily do things because of reward. The amount of effort that artists put into their work is completely disproportional sometimes to the income that they get from it, to uh, you know, a lot of other aspects that behaviorism would suggest that they would need to do things differently. But he said, no, artists don't don't really respond <clears throat> in the same way to that, that that behaviorism predicts that they will respond. They invest a lot more effort in their work than is uh, commensurate with their rewards. So there has to be something rewarding in the activity itself, not just in the outcome of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where the idea of flow came from. Hmm. Yeah, fantastic. That's beautiful. I, you know, I it, just to relate a little story. Um, you know, and folks, you know, we talked about being open, reactive, and responsive to, to uh, the external stimuli when you're on location, and and how to let go of your your, kind of your, quit stop being a camera owner and being an artist, and and quit worrying about your technology, and and be open to your environment. And, and uh, I just got back from a, a workshop in the Palouse, and guy, you were you were with me because I, I uh, was talking to somebody about this kind of concept as we were standing out amongst the wheat fields, and they were struggling to to find a, a photograph, and and because uh, partly because they were a little worried about their camera, and I told this wonderful story of of the, I think the first time I met you, uh, we were all three down in the Eastern Sierras, and I. One day I, I I asked you if you would just go take a walk. Let's go walk through the forest. And I want you to just give me a stream of consciousness description of what you're seeing from a from a photographic perspective. And that was just, you know, a phenomenal experience for me. And and it, but it, you know, it taught me a lesson of of how to open, be a little bit more open to and, and responsive to my environment. And so the folks that are listening, you know, if you struggle with this concept, finding somebody that that could help you open your eyes a little bit, just ask them, just ask them, what do you see? Why do you see that? What are you responding to? I mean, that's, that's one of the best ways to grow your artistry is not the seven tips for fall foliage. It's how are you seeing the world around you? Talk to me. When we, when we did the Sierra guy, if you remember... Remember one that one time I said we should be recording this because we were walking around. I mean, for two days we didn't even look at a camera. I, I, I'm driving around with Guy Tal in a car, okay? <laughs> and and like I'm I'm saying, okay, well, you know, let's see. I'm going to see what he he's going to see to photograph. And we didn't look at a camera for two days. We walked around talking about where we were taking people and what's here and what's there. And I said, man, we ought to be recording this. We could sell this. It was, it was an amazing thing. Learning how to see is critical. It's huge. Well, I, I think part of it, and then we'll get into the, ju- the, the, the meat and potatoes of this podcast. I think a lot of people are afraid of stuff that they they don't know about. And they're afraid to let themselves experiment with things that they're not comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And that's part of what I think I was saying too, you know, is that yeah. you, 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 you have to be divergent. Yeah. Uh, I think the the painter Henri Matisse uh, said it best. He said, creativity takes courage. Uh, and there's a, a great book I just recommended recently to someone called Creative Courage by uh, uh, another famous psychologist named Rollo May, uh, where he talks about, you know, being courageous to do things that have not been done before, being courageous to explore new things, even being courageous going against the the, the society and the community uh, that is has been doing these things uh, in certain ways for certain times, uh, you know, and they'll of course, to maintain the cohesion of the community, that they have certain norms, they have certain, you know, this is right, this is wrong, this is how you do things, this is not the right way to do things. And as artists, we have to have that courage because otherwise art would never evolve. And Rollo May said that we would not have served our purpose in society, which is to to agitate, to help people see new things in new ways, to think about new things in new ways, not just to keep doing the same thing over and over. You know, when you were talking before, I, I was going to say, you remind me of Miles, Miles Davis, with a lot of your thinking. And it not really, as much profanity, though. Well, no, and and, <laughs> and, and a lot more um, kind of like not, not quite as angry at, at times. <laughs> but I, I just want to read this little paragraph. I'm just going to send it to you last night. Um, 
This was uh, re- related by Gary Peacock, who's a bass player that played with uh, with Jarrett and a bunch of people, and with Miles for a while. It says, in 64, Peacock briefly joined Miles Davis, substituting for Ron Carter. Uh, Miles probably said one of the most brilliant, useful, necessary comments I've ever heard. Someone was recording with him, and Miles looked at him and said, what I want to hear is what you don't know. Mm-hmm. That's really the key, not the playing what you know, playing what you don't know. To do that, you have to get very quiet inside, listen and surrender to whatever that particular musical setting is. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't make any difference whether I'm playing standards or free stuff, because you're giving up any kind of fixed positions or attitudes you may have about what it should or shouldn't be. And to do that, you have to be vulnerable to be in a place where you realize that it's what you're after. You cannot know it's not conceivable. Mm-hmm. That's but the there. Thinking, it's yeah. the muse. It's kind of a switch from the self playing to the muse to the muse playing itself. Yeah. And I think there's another great uh, clip great from, uh, from Miles I'll Davis. Yeah. I'd love that. Yeah. He said, uh, I think somebody asked him about, uh, you know, what something he was going to play, what, what it means. And he said, I'll play it first and I'll tell you what it means after. <laughs> yeah. That was on the recording on Christmas Eve of 1954 of Bags Groove um, with Thelonious Monk and, and, and Percy Heath where Miles and Monk got into it and, 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 he didn't like what Monk was playing, so Monk refused to play while Miles was playing. It was just Miles and the bass player. And then when the rest of the band came in, Monk would play. And his his Miles had a lot of great comments like that. Mm-hmm. He said, I'll play it, play it, and I'll tell you what it is later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great, great stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I, John, I should have like a drum here. Drum roll. <laughs> We're we're breaking news in the photographic community today. I'm sure this will be quoted in all the publications and probably give us credit and everything, John, for for this. But you know, I was talking with a guy yesterday, and in a typical guy tal fashion, I asked him, "So what's new?" And he comes out with this big thing, like oh, that's no big deal, but this is what I'm doing. So, folks, you heard it here first. There's going to be a new book from Guy Tao, and it's not going to be shoot at a 125th at F8. It's going to be a continuum and a growth of Guy's other books that are extremely mentally stimulating. Guy, tell everybody what you're doing. Uh, sure. Actually, I just want to say from the start that this book will be a little bit different. In fact, I went to my publisher and I said, you know, I've, I have a lot of articles that are fairly ready for publication. I could create another book of essays similar to the the three that I already have. Uh, and uh, then uh, one of their staff said, well, you know, it would be really great uh, if you could write a book. And, and she specifically said, I don't know if you guys know the book Letters to Young Artists by the poet Rainer Maria Rilke. Uh, it, yeah. She said it would be interesting, you know, if, if I wrote a book of advice for photographers. Uh, and I thought about this a little bit and I thought, well, I mean, I've in teaching, I could take a lot of my teaching material and convert that to bits of advice uh, that, that would have been fairly easy. But then I thought, you know, I, I really want to do something a little beyond that. I'd like to push it a little bit more. And uh, uh, you guys probably know I, I've had a, a long, you know, multi-decades long interest in philosophy. So I decided to write a book along the same line of advice to a fellow artist, a fellow photographer, not necessarily a younger photographer. Uh, So it will be in the form of advice. It will be similar to a, a form of letters where it will be written me in first person speaking to you in second person uh, <clears throat> but it will rely on a lot of the philosophical uh, advice that that i've had or that i've uh, implemented in my own work uh, over the years so not just any one philosophical movement but you know borrowing from anything from from stoicism and existentialism and then you know analytic philosophy and a lot of things that have helped me learn a lot about the world and about creativity and about the science of it and about what makes it so rewarding about why it's important uh so try to distill that into bits of advice so uh <clears throat> this book will be a book of specifically of philosophical advice for photographers and other artists so it's not going to be necessarily specific to photography 
So more words than pictures. Uh, that's that's my <laughs> usual mo. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, guy, could you could you just I, I know you rattled off a few things, but really uh, simplistically, you know, could what what type of philosophy philosophical advice as an example could you give one to photographers like like, um, how, like how could they take your words and apply it to their work okay well i'm, I'm gonna confess what my uh my nefarious theme here is that it's not so much specific to photography it's about how to live your life so you can express it well i mean the artistic technique would be an expression of the way that you live your life uh and i think probably the the most dominant uh uh uh, philosophy, uh, philosophical theme, and it, it would be existentialism. Uh, it's not necessarily unique to that. I want to borrow from a lot of different things, but uh, existentialism is is founded on the idea that uh, the objective world, uh, the universe out there, uh, has no inherent meaning in it. It's completely meaningless, and it's up to us to make subjective meaning out of our living experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that would be the the gist of the advice. Is uh, and and I'll tell you, we already decided on the title of the book literally just yesterday. So uh, that would be a good time to to bring it up. It will be called "Be Exceptional," uh, because that comes from a, a quotation by Francis Bacon, the, the artist, not the philosopher, uh, where he's that it's all so meaningless, so we may as well be exceptional. Uh, and to me, that that is probably the the gist of the the, the whole uh, advice framework that that I have in mind is don't don't assume that there's meaning in the world that you're just gonna find or that's gonna come to you or that somehow is gonna manifest itself in you. You have to go out and make meaning. You have to go out and find meaning and then express this meaning in your work. So. By doing that, you're distilling it, you're enhancing it, you're enlarging it, you're elevating your life through artistic activity to uh, find the, the, the most meaningful things in life and, and find a way to express them in your work. Wow. Not easy. L living that life, I think, well, you know what, M maybe it maybe it's easier than I think if you, if you don't get caught up in stuff. Uh, oh, for sure. There's a lot of distractions, right? There's a lot of things that distract you from that. And some of it comes from the society you live in, the community that you live in, the established patterns in whatever field you're working in, whether it's photography or painting or, uh, yeah. But when you look at all the uh, the great creative revolutions in art, they came from people who specifically uh, decided that the, the status quo, the way things are done, quote unquote, the right way was not the only way, it was not the best way. And they were trying to look for different, better ways to do that. And it's interesting today, we take a lot of things for granted uh, that for a long time were extremely controversial. You know, things like uh, impressionism, everybody today thinks that impressionism is, is beautiful, right? And the time when impressionism actually occurred, it, it was controversial. Yeah, it was considered, I think Paul Strand called it the work of idiots. Uh, it got scathing critiques uh, and not just impressionism, almost every other movement that followed. You think of uh, Paul Cezanne, who was a post-impressionist, uh, yeah, I think uh, one critic said that uh, pregnant women should not go to see his exhibits because they might miscarry by looking at his. Look at look at Stravinsky. <laughs> his the right of spring. It was a riot. I mean, it literally, was almost a riot in the street. Oh yeah, oh premiered. yeah, in in Paris. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So I mean, today. People think Paul Cezanne is this great artist and his his work is beautiful. But for almost 40 years, nobody wanted to exhibit him. Uh, nobody wanted to do anything with his work. Uh, but, you know, that that wasn't what drove him. He he loved nature. He loved living in the south of France, which at the time was considered this provincial area away from the big city, not as prestigious. Uh, so he got he got ridiculed a lot for being just this country bumpkin who was playing, who was uh, painting uh, natural scenes that didn't even look very natural. But you know, today we know what an incredible artist it was. I think Picasso called him my one and only master. You know, so other artists called him a god of painting. And uh, but you know those things don't happen in real time you have to earn them you have to struggle for them and the struggle of finding meaning is is a huge part of it uh it's not just one day you stumble on a good idea and the next day the whole world loves it yeah for sure you know it's uh, john and i were talking in one of our recent podcasts about how controversial color film was when it first appeared mm -hmm. it was like the, the devil brought color film to us yeah and yeah you know, that was a Okay. 
It, no, it's just it just it, it, people just uh, you know things that are now everyday exception accepted things at one time were were totally totally debunked. You know, you bet, you bet. So, so as you were talking, kind of describing this guy, there's there's a couple of points that came up in my head for maybe folks listening to this program, and and uh, you know the first one is that we're regardless of whatever artistic medium you choose to express yourself, I think that we're many people are constrained by the rules of the medium, the rules of society. Um, you know, we feel like we're in this box, like we must do things this way. And so I, I, I sense people fighting a little bit against that. And then the second point is, is that we're constrained by ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're okay. afraid to, Perfect. to open up what's inside. We're afraid Perfect. to explore and expand. And, and both of those things are really big Im potential impediments to, growing as an artist huge yeah and uh so so when you said first we are constrained i wanted to correct you and say <laughs> a lot of us believe we're constrained but we're not really great at the point. end of the day we actually do have a lot of choices yeah they might be risky choices yes they might be uncomfortable choices yes they might come with certain penalties but they are nonetheless choices. And that, again, goes back to that philosophy of existentialism. Uh, if you look, if you read, you know, people like Sartre or Camus or even Martin Heidegger was probably the, the biggest proponent of it, which is kind of ironic because he was not he was not a good person. <laughs> but his philosophy was extremely, <clears throat> extremely meaningful. And he, he called it authenticity, living an authentic life uh, and living an authentic life means uh, he calls it being in the world, means under being you in the world, which is outside of you and what what that relationship means what is what it means to be the best human being that you can in the context of the world being what it is uh and to live authentically so uh, the whole idea of existentialism is really founded in the philosophy of people like nietzsche and kierkegaard and they it's really interesting that these two are considered the fathers of existentialism because kierkegaard was this extremely pious christian uh, and Nietzsche famously declared that God is dead, and he fought against Christianity tooth and nail. But both of them are considered the fathers of existentialism because both of them have reached the same, the same conclusion, which is at the end of the day, it's all about an individual making decisions and deciding their own value and living what Heidegger would say as authentically as possible according to your own values. Uh, and that all ultimately comes down to <clears throat> finding the courage to live authentically, to be what you are. Um, there is a, a famous passage, uh, you know, Nietzsche's most famous book, Thus Said Zarathustra. He, he, he talks about different phases that people can go through, not necessarily all go through. Uh, and the first phase that all people go through, he compared it to animals, was being a camel. Uh, being a camel means, you know, you carry your burden and, and you have a supposedly a good disposition and you want to help your society and you want to do the hard work and then you know you're willing to to carry the loads uh and he said most people are camels but then every now and then a camel will realize you know actually the society that i live in as much as i love them as much as their values are not exactly my values uh, and then you have to start fighting against uh, he described it as a dragon a dragon called thou shalt uh and that dragon dragon was covered in golden scales and each one of them was engraved saying thou shalt do this thou shalt do that uh pretty much the 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 norms of the the society uh and he said if you want to become a lion you have to slay that dragon it, like all these thou shalt don't apply to you you get to pick which ones apply to you and if you if some don't you get to invent your own and the only way you can free yourself from these constraints is you slay the dragon and you invent your own value based on your own uh sense of the world uh and then he said, okay, after people become lions, a lion has to say no to a lot of things. A lion lives a very aggressive life, constantly fighting. That's not a great way to live. And he said, once you become a lion and free yourself, then you can go a step further and become a child. And he said, a child doesn't fight against anything. A child just does what feels right. Uh, and so once you have freed yourself, now you have to go back to that innocence and say, okay, there's a whole big, beautiful world out there. This is how I feel about it. This is what I know about it. This is what seems to me the right way to live. Uh, and that's another very difficult transition. Um, 
But again, these are extremely, extremely difficult things. I mean, no matter how much we try to paint them as these, you know, quotable platitude and allegories at the end of the day, a lot of it can be extremely, extremely difficult and uncomfortable to do. But you have to go back to that point of saying, this is your life. This is the one you get. You got to do something with it, right? That goes back to the title of my book. It's all so meaningless. We may as well be ex- extraordinary. Um, yeah. Did I say exceptional first? I, it's I think so, yeah. Be, yeah. I, it's supposed to be, be extraordinary is the word. Right. Right now. Yeah. You know, a friend of mine said to me recently, he goes, you know, you listen. You know, I was listening to some music and he said, there's all these all these guys, these musicians and artists and you know, all these photographers I read about, man, they're all crazy. They all have these issues because they're none of them are normal. I said, define normal. Well, it's not just define normal. I mean, normal is is a, a statistic, right? You look at the big population exactly. and you find the averages, and and you say this is what a normal person is. But no actual individual is normal. <laughs> Everyone is a little bit different from that from that fictional normal. I, I think uh, what he's saying though is just that that you know artists tend to be fairly intense people, mm-hmm. and our society doesn't really accept that. You know. And and, yeah, and to them it's not normal, but to to Mahler it was normal, you know, and so be it. But I think that's the point of being a creative and expressive artist. Certainly, you can be a, a lot of different kinds of artists, and you know, uh, I'll give you an example that I, I've used in one of my articles is. I don't know if you remember uh, until a few years ago, if you go to a Subway sandwich restaurant, the the person serving you would have a tag saying sandwich artist, right? So yes, you could be an artist like a Subway sandwich maker, which means you follow a recipe to create a product that was designed by other people to satisfy a known taste and you know it's going to be popular. Uh, So that's one kind of artist. Uh, But if you open the dictionary and look up art, you will find multiple definitions of art. And yes, something like that could fit under some definition of artist. But there there are much higher bars that you could set for yourself, other definitions of art. And the one that is very consistently, the one that's often used in in scientific and academic studies uh, is that... Art is a product of human uh, creativity and imagination. Uh, I'm sorry, human creativity and skill. So art is something that is manufactured, A, by human beings, not by computers or AI or not generated, doesn't occur randomly or naturally. It's something that a human being has brought into the world using their creative skills and other artistic skill and their manual skills. Uh, and that, to me, is a much higher bar for art. And, and that's the kind of artist that I want to be. Uh, so, yeah, I can say by that definition, there are certain things that would be art by other definitions, but that are not art by that by that criteria. Yeah. Well, Guy, I got to tell you, I, you know, and when this is due out in 2024. Uh, yeah. Well, the manuscript is due kind of into 2024. So I'm guessing it will come out probably toward the end of next year. Wow. That's well, exciting. when can I order? <laughs> 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 I can sell it to you, but there's nothing to sell yet. So. It's okay. I'll buy it. Um, what? Uh, so, I, what? You have a new vehicle, and you're and you're now exploring places again, easier, correct? Uh, more comfortably, yes. More comfortably, <laughs> better, better thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, People are going to ask, "What do you what, describe your 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 home away from home?" Uh, well, I I mean, I know this desert pretty well, and there's a range of beautiful uh, uh, environments here, from from the the Red Rock Canyons all the way up to Alpine meadows and and lakes. And so, I I know a lot of these places pretty well. I can usually find a place where I can get away and and have a, a quiet place to myself. I will set up my camp. Uh, usually, I will spend the first couple of days just you know making myself at home. Uh, for me, part of the way that I work, and again, I don't want to. I don't want it to sound like this is the right way versus some other way being wrong. But there's that's, no right way. That's yeah. for every person to decide for themselves. But for me, 
I, I need to be a part of the story. I don't just go to a place that is aesthetically pretty and point a camera at it and get out of there. Uh, I want to be part of that place. I want to live in that place. I want to see what wildlife, what the weather is like, what the light is doing. So usually I would spend a couple of days just setting up my camp and just, just walking around. Uh, I love walking. I walk very long distances, fairly long distances. I will just go exploring, see what's around everywhere. I don't necessarily stick to trails. I go see what's in the woods, what's over the ridge what the view is like in different directions, uh, see what the light is doing at different parts of the day, just kind of make myself a part of the environment, fit myself into the environment. And then I get a sense a sense of it, and that sense of it pretty much dictates where I go from there. What do I have to say about that experience? Uh, and some of it is inspired by the place, and some of it obviously is, is what I bring with me, you know, whatever is happening in my own life, whatever I happen to be feeling, uh, all that merges with my experience in the place to hopefully produce something that's expressive of, of those feelings. Hmm. And that reflects in the work. Yeah. And then for me, you know, for me being a professional, it's it's a weird thing how that term professional has, has evolved in recent years. But really? but for me being being a professional means that I get to do that I get to earn an income doing that. So that that frees me to to go and work for as long as I want. So when I go, it's not hey I have three days or a week or two weeks off from work and I'm going to go and do this and then I have to come back. I don't have, usually I don't have to come back. Uh, I can go to one place, spend a week there, come but go back, buy some groceries, go out for another week somewhere else. Uh, uh, so I, I, for me, that that's a great lifestyle because uh, that that's the type of person I am. I'm extremely introverted. Uh, I don't like schedules. Uh, as we talked about personality traits, uh, there's a, also personality traits for, for people who are very organized versus people who are not very organized. So I'm not very organized. I don't like to follow schedules. I don't like to follow plans. Uh, I'd like to just get out there, see what happens, decide what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's, you know, as you were talking, I mean, that's, that's just a, a wonderful way of being and, and, and how you've evolved into that. You know, I think for, I think for folks listening, of course, a lot of, a lot of people can't take two weeks off to go get immersed into a landscape to get in touch with their surroundings and be responsive yeah. and reactive to that. But, you know, I, I, I think that there's things that people can do even day to day, you know, just pause, just stop, leave your camera in your bag when you go onto a location and just walk around for a half, you can spare half an hour. Just yeah. walk around and and observe and just be and feel what the environment has to say to you. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, going back to that, there, there were for a long time, I mean, I've had other careers for a long time. I didn't believe that I could take that kind of time and do that kind of thing. But for me, that's what it meant to be a professional. It meant that I could earn a living doing that. So, oh, wow, bird just smashed into the window. Um, but the, but that, that's guy, what you were saying. These are decisions that, you, you know, you made a decision to walk away sure. from you I, know, I can tell you, I've, I've, the IT yeah. business twenty years ago. More uh, than yeah, and and for as long as I've been doing this today, I don't make as much as I did in my corporate job in my last corporate job before I quit. But okay. you know, like you said, we always have choices. They're not necessarily easy choices. They're not necessarily convenient choices. They're not necessarily choices that align with the interests of other people. I uh, just my circumstances allowed me to take a little time off to figure out what I wanted to do. And I wanted to see if I could find a way to earn a living. So I didn't have to go to an office. So I didn't have to deal with customers. So I didn't have to, you know, uh, so even though those options were far from obvious, right. The easiest thing for me would just say, hey, I have a great job. I have a, you know, a good place to live. Or, you know, I live in a, in a enlightened, fairly enlightened country. Uh, and a lot of people, those are things that for a lot of people would just be incredible. Uh, but I got to a point where I've had that and I didn't feel fulfilled by it. I have never been wealthy. I, I don't have independent resources. I have to. Earn oh, well, I heard. Yeah, I have to earn an income. Yeah, but I thought, okay, so let's say that I did want to do. What can I do? Well, I could, I could write. You know, I could sell books. I could try to sell photography. I could teach, and those things would allow me to at least try something. At least, you know, quit my job and go see if I could do it. And you know, that was far enough. I, I could have fallen flat on my face and failed. 
But to me, that's part, a huge part of what makes this so meaningful to me is I had to figure it out. I had to use my own creativity and my own skills, not just to do my work, but to figure out how I can sustain myself doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to, to that Matisse words where creativity takes courage, it's not just that it takes courage to do something that other people haven't done before. It takes courage to, to live as an artist. It takes courage to, to going back to existentialism, to make your own values, uh, to, to be who you are. That's the famous quote from Nietzsche. That's the foundation of existentialism is become who you are because everybody's different. I, you know, go back. I had a group once in um in Monument Valley, and someone who wasn't with my group was there, and he was a young young guy, and um, so I had the group out, and we we're photographing, and this guy comes up to me, he goes, you must be the leader, and, you know, and, you know, how do you get to do this, I'd love to do this, and I want to be, you know, I want to become a, a, a photographer instead of working in my day job, and and, you know, what do you think? What should I do? And I said, well, you know, I mean, you got to figure out what you want to do and figure it out. And one of my attendees walks up to me says, what are you telling them that for? Man, it's, this is it's so, this is crazy. It's, yeah. You know, you're not going to live, you know, you're not going to have, you know, 10 cars in the big thing. Yeah. And I looked at this guy, I said, who am I to tell somebody not to follow something that they want to do. I mean, follow your dreams, I could yeah. end up being the next Galen Rowell for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got to tell you an anecdote and, and then one more point, if we have the time, if you don't mind. Uh, so go, going back to, you know, since I have philosophy on my mind now, going back to Nietzsche, to Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Uh, the story is about this person named Zarathustra. He's named after the, the god Zoroaster, who was. This the, is not the musical piece that become, became famous. It's actually a <laughs> yeah, book was it? yep. written way before the music. Yeah, it was after, yeah, long before the music. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so in the story, this person, uh, he lives in the mountains alone, uh, and he matures and becomes very enlightened. And he decides, you know, the right thing for me to do would be to come down from the mountain and tell people what I've learned, what I found out, that they can actually live better lives, that they can live more meaningfully, etc. So he goes down from the mountain and he, he meets with people and he tries to convince them that they are free to choose, that they are that they don't have to be bound by the, the all these ancient values that they've been tied into. And of course, they, they rebuff him at every point. But the first person that he meets when he comes down from the mountain is a religious saint, uh, and he's the only one that Zarathustra decides not to teach what he's learned. Because he said, you know, I, I see how you live and you absolutely love everything about it and it's meaningful to you. And even though I think you are wrong about the world, obviously you are living a meaningful life. So I'm, I have nothing to teach you. Uh, so it's not like my way is the right way. It's like the point is for you to live an authentic, fulfilling life. However, whatever that means to you. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's the first anecdote. The other anecdote is, I, you know, this, this might be a, a little challenging to hear, but there's also the opposite point of view where, we're, you know, a lot of people today are kind of born into fairly well-to-do lives and, 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 you know, don't have the same struggles that other people have had. Uh, and they, they fall for the platitudes like, well, you can be whatever you want to be or just decide what you want to be and go out. Nothing is guaranteed. Actually, that they, the possibility that you will fail sometimes is greater than the possibility that you will Correct. succeed. A and B, the possibility that you will fail is what makes it meaningful. Uh, you can't just be whatever you want to be. You can try. You should try. But there's no guarantee. And if you fail, you might have to find to figure out how else you could live that would be meaningful to you. Uh, so it's not a it's not a recipe for success. Actually, you will find a lot of writers in this genre uh, belittling success. You know, success is not what you think it means. Um, it's not being financially well off. It's not owning a lot of things. It's not being popular. It's not being loved. It's not, you know, none of this is really success. Success is living an authentic life. Success is living by your own value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, you know, let me, uh, before we, we, we bang this up, any last thoughts for Guy, John? I'm just, uh, once again, my, my mind is going in a multitude of different directions because I love, I love exploring this this concept in in being authentic in our art, and you know, as I'm growing and evolving and aging, you know, I'm I'm finding those things that are important to me, um, and it's it's coming into sharper focus. And 
you know, Jack, kind of taking it back to photography, Jack, you say that, you know, the picture is not important. It's the experience and the people we meet. And, and, you know, I totally agree with that. And, but it's this ability to, to live as an artist and think and feel like an artist and not a camera owner, not a, you know, whatever bound by convention, that to me is the richness of life that, uh, I, I think guy you're on the you're on the kind of the vanguard in this community around pushing this uh, not pushing well, I, it but but opening up people's minds to the possibility of living beyond constraints and norms and and uh those types of things to really be authentic in what you do as mm -hmm. an artist yeah and I think you phrase it perfectly the way that you just said it yeah, it's it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I I just love this love this conversation. Thank you. Maybe the next the third book after the next two guys should be. And in fact, you're gonna you're doing it. You could have called this book "Living as an Artist" in a way. As you know, you, we most successful artists, whatever that means, um, live live a little bit different than. The nine to five, uh, you know, three kids and the white fence yeah. and the yeah. cars. And I, and I would say it's not just artists. It's just a certain kind of people. And some of these people are scientists and some of these people are poets and some of these yeah. people are, you and, know. And it goes are, down to that self-actualization. Was it, yeah. was it Maslow? Was it Maslow's yeah, Maslow, hierarchy? Yeah. yeah, the self-actualization mm -hmm. that yeah. that how far you get up that is. Yeah, and is, actually the. Yeah, it's interesting okay. if you read a lot of psychology, there's actually complete branches of psychology that are based on existential existentialist uh, psychology. And a lot of the greatest psychologists have uh, have been a lot of good, good writers on psychologies uh, have been existentialists and are existentialists. Yeah, well, just learn, learning to expand yourself and grow as a human being, I think, is the ultimate life goal and life path. For sure. Well, I would say it should be because it's the easiest thing in the world is to just take something from your environment and say, I'm just going to live like that because it works and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy. I think that was the word you used. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Guy, thank you again. It's oh, always, yeah, you know, always when, a pleasure. We, yesterday when the phone rang, I, I left Guy a message what, a few weeks ago when you were out in wherever you were. And then uh, when the phone rang yesterday afternoon and it, it said Guy Tal on it, I said, you know, I can't wait to, to let me <laughs> hello, you know, um, and 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 I have to tell you, and I know this sounds again sappy, but it's such an honor to to be able to call you one of my my best friends. And oh, I like that, man. Um, yeah. You know, uh, we could do this. I think John and I could do this once a week, and it wouldn't be enough. But thank you for being here. And again, folks, um, we'll we'll have Guy on again, maybe when the book is written, if not before, and then certainly we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll let everybody know when it's coming more definitively. And I, I think this could be the best. I said this the last book. This could be the best. <laughs> the best. The best is uh, you know what's that tune? The best is yet to come. And, and uh, thank you so much for taking some time uh to be here when are you, you again, tomorrow i'm sorry when are you leaving again um i think probably a couple more days yeah yeah and 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 you're going north or south or east or west i haven't yeah. even decided on that there yet you go. See <laughs> that? wake up in the morning and decide yeah. yeah well anyhow um folks thanks guy for being here um John, I think we nailed it. Any last questions? I think no, sir. I think we're doing great, folks. Thank you all for taking some time. I hope you all listened to this more than once. There's a lot to unpack here. Yep. Uh, and, and please um, take a listen to this, either video or audio or while you're driving. It, it'll help you be a better person. Forget a photographer, an artist, a better person. Um, questions, comments, or we talk photo at gmail.com. And until next time, um, we'll say, see ya. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Guys. Yeah. You're the best. Thank you. <laughs>